Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Carol Cohn. I am so pleased to be able to welcome you to our symposium, Confronting the Climate Crisis, Feminist Pathways to Just and Sustainable Futures. I'm the director of the Consortium on Gender Security and Human Rights that has put this symposium together. Um, the, sympo the consortium is based at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, even though we are not sitting there right now and you are not sitting there right now, probably everybody is sitting on their couches. Um, but in, um, particularly in a symposium that is about the climate crisis, it feels really important to acknowledge the land upon which the University of Massachusetts, Boston resides. Uh, UMass Boston is based on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts and Pawtucket people. We need to honor indigenous people's relationships with their traditional territories, to acknowledge the violent history of genocide and forced removal from this territory, and to honor and respect the diverse indigenous people still connected to this land. I want to also say that land acknowledgements are only one small step toward ensuring a culture of respect truth and accountability in our community. It's critical that we go beyond it into action, combating the ongoing violence directed against indigenous peoples. If any of you are interested in learning more about the land on which you live or work, we're um, putting into the chat box some information that will send you to a, a map that contains a lot of information about this in different parts of the world, even though not complete. So um, before the symposium's first panel begins, I wanna talk a little bit about why we organized this particular symposium and how we're thinking about it. Um, first and foremost, the reason that we organized it is simply because we are in a historical moment of unprecedented planetary peril. I think if you are zooming into the symposium, I don't really need to try to convince you of that. Um, you know the crises that we face, both climatological and ecological, are of a scale and urgency that is hard to actually comprehend and to hold in our consciousness. You know that so many of the processes already activated will have effects beyond what scientists can model and predict. And you know that climate disruption is already having tremendously destructive effects on people, animals, ecosystems around the world, but especially among communities in the global south and marginalized communities in the global north that have the least responsibility for these crises crises, which is a particularly infuriating and wildly unjust aspect of them. But in the face of the urgency of governments, corporations, intergovernmental organizations, scientific researchers, funders, institutional investors, and so many more taking rapid comprehensive action to halt and reverse the destructive planetary processes that they themselves have helped put into motion, in the face of that urgency, the response has been lethargic and anemic. And in the face of the scale of the actions needed, their small steps, empty rhetoric, and halfway measures can only be seen as suicidal, homicidal, ecocidal. Um, but there are some positive signs. We're trying to be on that side. Um, foremost among them, a worldwide mobilization of climate activists and environmental defenders, and also a profusion of proposals for, <coughs> excuse me, for new deals, including not only green new deals focusing on clean energy future, but a blue deal to restore the oceans, a purple deal focusing on valorizing care and the care economy, and a red deal focusing on indigenous leadership, indigenous perspectives, and indigenous knowledge. In this symposium, <coughs> excuse me, in this symposium, we aim to call attention not only to the climate crisis, but also to what is at stake in the kinds of responses to it that are proposed, whether by social movements, corporations, international organizations, or obscenely wealthy individual philanthropists. What impels us is deep concern that many of the proposed fixes that are getting the most airplay, the most traction, and the most funding are rooted in the same political economic paradigms and worldviews that created the current climate and ecological crises in the first place. That they often not only pose great environmental risks themselves, but also threaten to gravely deepen existing inequalities within and between nations. And they simply don't offer and aren't based on the kind of deep transformations in our approach to the planet we live on, on the scale and urgency that these crises demand. So the symposium will highlight some of the diversity and depth 
of feminist approaches to addressing the climate crisis, including the critically important work being done by diverse feminist thinkers from feminist political economists and ecologists to indigenous and racial justice activists, because we believe that these feminist approaches are critical to the fundamental transformations that are so urgently needed. Why do we think feminist approaches have such a key role to play? Well, to put it very simply, at the heart of what we need now in order to change the current path toward climate and eco-catastrophe are two things which we know are deeply interrelated. We need to change and indeed radically transform dominant power structures and dominant ways of thinking. And further, we know that that will require global action, that there is no entirely local or national solution to the crisis, and that means we need to be able to work with each other across differences and to create to mobilize political power and generate new ways of thinking across those differences globally. So in one way that sort of sounds simple, but it's also a really tall order, humans haven't really proven themselves to be great at transforming dominant power structures and dominant ways of thinking, nor doing the hard work of building transnational collaborations and solidarities. But I think that feminist approaches, feminist theory, feminist activism, have focused powerfully on those very challenges and have a lot of resources to bring to bear in trying to make this happen. So that's the really short version of why we're doing this symposium. I wanna take a little time now to unpack it a bit, starting with elaborating a little bit more about the interrelated um, needs to change dominant power structures and dominant ways of thinking. So take, for example, structures such as mining corporations, agribusiness companies, or weapons manufacturers they won't change in fundamental ways just because they have women or people of color running them. As long as it's integral to those institutions that they think their primary responsibility is to maximize profit um, over the short term, to provide value to their shareholders, and as long as the human and environmental costs of their actions are not part of their accounting systems and not considered part of what they are responsible to pay for, and as long as the dominant economic paradigm makes it appear perfectly reasonable to leave those costs out, which in turn legitimizes governments not intervening and demanding a change in the way business as usual is done. So changes in power structures is not just about who's sitting at the top of those structures, but rather transformation of those structures themselves and the ways of thinking, the assumptions and values that are integral to them that both underwrite those power structures and are reinforced by them. Or to take another example of that relationship, as long as land that is left in its natural state is considered idle and useless and wastefully undeveloped, or land that is used in sustainable ways by local communities for generations is seen as underdeveloped, as inefficiently exploited. As long as value is understood principally in terms of how a natural resource can be extracted or exploited to produce financial wealth rather than any other way we might think about value. As long as those ways of thinking are promulgated by and embodied in the dominant institutions which frame our understandings of the world, it will seem reasonable to develop to development banks and institutional and individual investors and corporations to fund and engage in fracking um, and in the destruction of the Amazon and to buy up huge swaths of land for biofuel production while destroying everything from species habitats to local human communities and the livelihoods of the people in them. So I think that feminist approaches bring a superb set of resources to the urgent task of changing those power structures and dominant ways of thinking that have brought us to this climate crisis abyss. Now, um, to explain why, I need to say a bit about feminism and feminist approaches, and that is always a bit challenging because, of course, there are many different feminisms, as will be evident throughout the symposium, and each one of them on its own is very complex and multifaceted. And not only is it inappropriate for me to try to speak for anybody else's version of feminism, but also in many ways, the idea of creating like a master narrative about what feminism is or feminisms are, is itself utterly contradictory to the idea of feminism as evident in the master part of master narrative. Um, so when I talk about the resources that feminism brings, I'm gonna base it on a few of the facets of feminism, a few of the assumptions about feminist approaches that drive the work of the consortium and that led to the symposium. 
Okay, a few basic points. Um, the first point in my mind is that feminist analysis is centrally concerned with two things, inequality and power. It takes inequality as a central problem to be solved, not only inequality between genders, but also, also within them, say among women and, or among men, which means that feminism can't just look at gender inequality per se, but that it must find equally problematic all of the other intersecting ways that inequality is structured into societies, whether along lines of race, ethnicity, caste, class, sexuality, age, physical ability, and so on, um, both within societies and also between societies globally which means that when you bring feminist approaches at their best to addressing the climate crisis, issues of intersecting inequalities and global justice become front and center. In terms of thinking about power, feminist approaches seek to analyze and transform power relations. They look at how power is structured in society in multiple ways, intersecting ways, and look at how it is exercised, what makes it possible to exercise power. And when you think about that, you see that different systems of structuring power not only intersect with each other, but they also shape each other. They're employed by each other in the exercise of power. So just as ideas about race and ethnicity shape are woven into and uphold gendered power relations, so are ideas about gender employed in legitimizing racialized power structures and racialized violence. And ideas about both race and gender underwrite centuries of colonial and imperial global power relations from Gayatri Spivak's classic formulation, white men saving brown women from black men, and the rugged, muscular, heroic masculinity of conquest to the rationalist, prudent, technocratic masculinity of good government, good governance. That's my first point. My second point concerns the global action and working across differences that is so urgently needed now. Feminists, and particularly but not only feminist activists, have been working at this for a long time. They've prioritized building transnational and transversal movements and solidarities and working together across difference, whether it's in things like feminist peace activism or feminist human rights activism. Now, I'm not saying that feminists have always done a great job of it. It's a complicated, ongoing learning process but it is something that we have prioritized and learned a lot about. And that seems to me to be completely key if something like a global climate justice movement is ever going to succeed. My third point is that feminism brings methodological commitments and epistemological perspectives that are really crucial in the struggle that we're in. A bedrock political and methodological commitment of feminism has been to take women's experiences seriously, not just of, as objects of knowledge, not just what do we need to know about those women in order to do X, Y, or Z, but taking women's experiences seriously as sources of knowledge. To say women know things, diverse women have different knowledge from each other, and that what they know matters in a significant to say that in a world in which a dominant class of men has had the power to determine what counts as knowledge, as relevant, as serious, as important, is revolutionary. To take diverse women seriously as knowers is revolutionary. And that fundamental insight then is not then that it's just true of women, but all marginalized and subordinated groups have knowledge that has not been recognized as knowledge in the dominant culture. Um, that, and that in turn gives us the basis for some wider um, critical epistemological perspectives. First of all, the idea that all knowledge is situated knowledge. No one has the monopoly on the rights, the realistic, the accurate ways to see the world. Instead, what you see depends on where you stand. There's a different view from the top or the bottom of the heap. Not only do you see different things or see the same thing from a different perspective, but you also have to know different things. The colonizer and the colonized need to know different things in order to survive because of the power relations between them. And this idea of situated knowledge relates to a second idea, that what counts as knowledge, sorry about that, depends on what you are trying to accomplish. That is what counts as knowledge, sorry for the dropping computer, 
um, what counts as knowledge and the kinds of knowledge you develop is not only based on where you're situated, but it's also based on what you're trying to do. Um, as feminist philosopher Sarah Reddick put it, thinking arises from and is tested against practices. What counts as knowledge, what counts as rational, what counts as true depends on the practices you engage in, the ends you are trying to accomplish through those practices. So for example, even for people who are similarly situated in geographic and socioeconomic space, um, the knowledge and belief systems you need if you're trying to live in a mutually protective, restorative, interdependent relation to the natural world is not the same as the knowledge you need if your goal is to manipulate, dominate, extract, and to bend the natural world to your will. The kinds of knowledge and belief systems you need if your goal is to live in relationships of respect and equality across differences between people is different than the kinds of knowledge and belief systems you need if your goal is to dominate, to exercise power over others whether that other is a life partner or a state or a whole people. So we're now in a situation where dominant forms of knowledge and belief throughout at least 500 years of colonialism and imperialism and through the development of different stages of capitalism, all with patriarchy shot straight through, have gotten us to the life-threatening crises we face today. That other knowledge is needed and that there are rich sources of it throughout populations that have been marginalized and subordinated along multiple axes of power must be equally clear, but of course in most places it's not. In academic institutions or policy institutions or governments or the corporate world, because part of exercising power is delegitimating those other forms of knowledge from marginalized groups. It's delegitimated as gossip or as storytelling or as primitive or pre-scientific or anecdotal or as superstitious as heathen as being led by feelings or sentiment or idealism instead of by rationality or delegitimized simply as trivial, not serious, insignificant, irrelevant to the problem at hand. As of course that problem has been defined by those who are holding the power of definition. So if we think that forestalling the, clim the worst of the climate crisis cannot come from only ever more technological advancement that sits comfortably within current patriarchal, racist, imperialist, capitalist frameworks and structures, but it will instead require drawing on many other kinds of knowledge and value systems, then we not only need those other marginalized knowledges and worldviews to be recouped, made more visible, revalorized and recentered, but we also need to denaturalize the dominant belief systems, paradigms, disciplines, um, and delegitim that delegitimate those alternative worldviews if we want them to be anything more than tokenized. We need to show that dominant ways of thinking about science and technology, about the quest for state power and interstate rivalry, about economics and the nature of economic man, and more that those dominant ways of thinking that claim the mantle of realism, that claim to be self-evidently the most sensible way to approach things, the best and truest descriptors of the world as it really is, whether you like it or not, little girl, um, that they do not represent universal truths and feminist approaches can make them more visible as partial situated forms of knowledge like any other forms of knowledge that are based in specific practices, engaged in by specific categories of people with the goal of achieving specific ends. And in this case, those practices and those ways of thinking have led us to this abyss. Until we can make those ways of thinking appear strange, denaturalize them, they will keep on taking up all the space, defining which issues are talked about, how they're talked about, and what solutions are seen as realistic, as legitimate, as serious, or as feasible in the halls of national and international power. And part of what I think you'll see in this symposium is the brilliant set of resources for, um, that feminist approaches bring to that task of denaturalizing those ways of thinking. So I think we should start the symposium. Um, let me just give you a bit of a brief conceptual map 
Um, one of the many things I just have not said about feminist approaches is that they emerge from and continuously develop in the sphere of activism, that they've also had a lively life and complex development in the academy, and that as feminism is both critical and visionary, um, and at the heart centered on the transformation of inequalities and the structures that produce them, there are significant numbers of feminists who are devoted to the translation of and enactment of feminist ideas in policy and in policy institutions. The challenges and tensions of that project is one more thing to be watching for in the symposium. So today's panel, the first one, is designed to showcase something of the breadth of what it can mean to bring different kinds of feminist approaches to the climate crisis. On the second day, we'll first be looking at feminist critiques of some dominant ways of thinking about the climate crisis and the solutions those ways of thinking offer. And then in the second panel of the day, we'll drill down deeper on one of those frameworks seen in ideas about development and sustainable development. And then on the third day, we turn to two panels that explore feminist pathways to just and sustainable futures. So let's start the first panel. It gives me great pleasure to pass you on to the moderator of the first panel, my friend and colleague, Elora Chowdhury. She's professor of women's, and gender, women's gender and sexuality studies and director of the human rights minor at the University of Massachusetts. Her research and teaching interests include transnational feminisms, gender violence, and human rights cinema, and she's the author of, among other things, a book called, a wonderful book called Transnationalism Reversed, Women Organizing Against Gendered Violence in Bangladesh, and co-author of a brand new book on South Asian filmscapes, Trans Regional Encounters. She's also an affiliated researcher with the consortium, and we're lucky to have her as a member of our advisory board. So I'm going to turn it over to Elora now to begin the panel and just want to say that I am tremendously looking forward to the exploration that we are all going to be doing together over these next three days. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Caro, and um, good morning to everyone. If you are joining us uh, from North America and good afternoon, good evening depending on um, your location. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure to moderate this inaugural panel today titled Confronting the Climate Crisis, Feminist Pathways to Just and Sustainable Futures. Before I turn to our very distinguished panelists today, I just want to say a few words about um, the layout of the panel. Uh, so I will be introducing each panelist before they make their remarks um, and they will each be making comments uh, for 10 minutes. Um, following the commentaries by our panelists, we will have 20 minutes of discussion among the panelists where they can raise questions to each other. Uh, following that, we will be turning to audience questions and you uh, will have the opportunity to submit your questions in the Q&A um, function of Zoom. Um, at the end of the Q&A session, we will have uh, about 10 minutes of final reflections and wrap up, and we will invite each panelist to say a, a few words um, of takeaway message for the day. So, um, I will now turn to our first uh, panelist, Professor Deborah McGregor. Um, Deborah McGregor Anishinaabe is from Whitefish River First Nation, Birch Island, Ontario. Uh, at York University, she is joint faculty with Osgood Hall Law and Environmental Studies and Urban Change, and is Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Environmental Justice. Professor McGregor's research has focused on indigenous knowledge systems and their various applications in diverse contexts, including environmental and water governance, environmental justice, health and environment, climate change, and indigenous legal traditions. She's actively involved in a variety of indigenous communities, serving as an advisor 
and community-based research and initiatives has been at the forefront of the indigenous environmental justice and indigenous research theory and practice in her work. She is co-editor of Indigenous Research, Theories, Practices, and Relationships. So, Professor McGregor. Thank you for that introduction and uh, Carol for setting the setting the stage. I really appreciate that, especially the land acknowledgement. Uh, and with that, I'm uh, on the territories of the uh, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Wendat communities and numerous other Indigenous nations, including um, Métis. Um, and I'm fortunate, I'm Anishinaabe, and I get to live and work in my own territory, so I'm very honored and privileged to be able to, um, to do that. So um, I am now going to try to share my screen and this is always uh, an experiment. And again, I want to welcome everyone from, uh, for joining us. I know that we're all um, in different parts of the world and, and I know maybe even some people it's the middle of the night. So I really appreciate you joining this, uh, this conversation. So uh, one, of the, one of the things I, I wanted to talk about, and I am trying to be very conscious of time as well, is what does Indigenous feminism bring to the conversation on climate change um, and climate justice and climate uh, crisis? And building a little bit on what Carol talked about is um, whose knowledge counts, who's not heard in a lot of these conversations. And it, and it goes a bit beyond that to um, who also in Indigenous feminisms, and again, there's diversity in this as well, like you, there's no blob of Indigenous uh, feminism, as I call it. Um, it's actually knowledge also from the land itself, so it's not what we're obtaining, um, but it's also how we're learning from and what knowledge is actually contained within uh, the, earth, uh, the earth itself. So it's a bit, um, I think that's something that we can, uh, as Indigenous feminists, add to the conversation that's just starting to be talked about and what I want to do in my very brief remarks is sort of point to three major international um, Indigenous women's declarations that kind of bring out some of that narrative um, that I think is important to add to the broader conversations on, um, on climate justice. So, so to me, one of the, one of the main um, contributions that Indigenous feminism brings to the conversation is we get to hear voices that we don't commonly hear people who are actually experiencing on the ground um, the effects of uh, climate change. And the situation in many Indigenous communities, and I can speak to more so to the situation in Canada, is a lot of Indigenous communities, uh, or many, are experiencing multiple crises. It's not just the climate crisis, that exas exacerbates just about everything else, infrastructure, housing, um, health. So, so, there's, so on top of the current, um, climate crisis that now everyone's confronted with in, Indigenous peoples also are experiencing other kinds of uh, crisis at the same time. So the the other aspect of this that I, I did want to mention is because it's very easy to uh, and a lot of the very dominant narrative on climate justice and Indigenous peoples particularly women paints Indigenous women as, very, as vulnerable which is true to climate change and climate justice but it's a really important point to also acknowledge too that Indigenous peoples have faced and continue to face genocidal policies. Uh, and here we are, we've managed to survive through major environmental and often climatic changes through forced removal. And we figured out ways how to survive that and continue to flourish. So we, we, we always have to be careful of, of um, not getting kind of stuck in the deficit uh, narrative when we're talking about Indigenous peoples um, and Indigenous women. So the Beijing Declaration of Indigenous Women, I like, um, I'm not gonna read this because everyone can read this themselves. These are all public domain, you can find them. But I wanted to just highlight here that Indigenous women for a long time have been talking about, like what is the foundation of, of how we're gonna relate to the world differently? And for us, a lot of that has to do with our Indigenous legal traditions. And here people talk about it as natural laws. I've seen this for years. Um, in my own uh, in my own work, and now in Canada and other places, we're just starting to know the place of codifying and documenting to be able to share with others, so that they can start learning from those um, from those traditions as well. 
uh, the Mandeleong Declaration. Um, here I wanted to focus a bit on how they're really pointing to a more holistic framework. So breaking down those silos, uh, which we can be guilty of in the academy and in, in terms of our discipline, and really trying to move towards um, gender-based solutions and approaches. Um, and that there's a knowledge base in relation to um, climate change and climate crisis and climate justice that we also have to be, um, be aware of as well. Um, there are, uh, I've been part of also developing some of these climate-based solutions in Canada, like a lot of my research also relates to the water crisis um, and what, what that looks like. But a lot of, what a lot of these solutions bring are these other voices to the fore like experiences that I may not have even as an Indigenous woman in the academy isn't the same as a remote Lion community and the experiences there. So it's, it's really important to be able to attune yourself to the voice that people have in relation to what they see as approaches. Um, so this is the Lima Declaration in 2013. Um, I, the main point I wanted to make with this particular um, image and declaration is that whatever it is that the earth experiences um, also women experience and vice versa so as an indigenous woman the violence that uh, indigenous women experience and recently in canada there was a national inquiry on indigenous women and missing murder, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls so all of that violence that women experience the land and earth also experiences and vice versa um, so it's sort of sort of moving around being very uh what i would call human centric to really trying to understand what it is that the land itself is experiencing or the earth itself is experiencing. And I think this is, um, you know, one of the distinct perspectives that Indigenous feminisms can bring into the conversation. Um, and also having a voice, everything about us, um, with us. Um, and this brings me to the Universal Declaration on the Rights of, of Mother Earth. Um, so one of the and this is also part of my, my work in communities. And, and often what I do is I'm working in communities and I'm listening to what a lot of youth and, and elders are saying. I'm often called in to you know, facilitate more, be a helper. I'm not gonna tell people what they should think um, or not think. And there's this very common narrative that, that comes out that's reflected in the Universal Declaration on the Rights of, of Mother Earth. And that's, um, we're really trying to, to advance like a rights and human rights based approach to addressing the, the climate uh, crisis. But it's not only that, it's also living up to our responsibility. So indigenous peoples due to this long history connected to the land have in knowledges that can contribute to, uh, to the dialogue. And there's a, an obligation and a responsibility to share that, but also live up to that knowledge as well. Um, and that we have an obligation to ensure that future generations are able to also um, be able to understand and live up to those uh, knowledge bases as well to ensure the flourishing of mother earth now that's a different way of thinking that let's just survive this but actually we want to flourish how can we actually give to the earth to enable the earth to flourish as opposed to like damage control which is a lot of the dominant narrative we're in damage control mode right now um like when the ipcc reports come out the ipbs reports come out Recently, a lot of the narrative and research coming out on COVID-19 and where the origins of that relating to climate change uh, and human um, beings unsustainable relationship uh, with the earth. So what are the what are these other kind of um, messages that we can uh, learn from indigenous peoples. Um, imagining our future. So in Again, in some of the, the work that I do, how can we then manage, manage our way out of this? Because I, I find as scholars, we're really good at diagnosing problems in feminism and indigenous feminism is great at, at diagnosing and pointing out uh, where the, the weaknesses are and a lot of the broader narrative that, that Carol pointed to and that other panelists uh, will also point to. But what is that? How can we imagine a different kind of future? And for indigenous peoples, that's what is our kind of self-determined future in light of everything that we're facing based on what we've already had to face in the past? And what I've seen come out that I don't see ever when I'm reading a lot of these international reports that always deliver bad news to us is this idea of um, love. That's come up just about in every single Indigenous meeting that I've ever convened or had the privilege of facilitating and, and working with. Um, and that we, part of our, our narrative is how do we actually show love for the earth? Um, and in this, we're also recognizing the earth as having um, agency. 
that the earth is is actually alive and convey knowledge and we can coexist with as opposed to what do we need to do to the earth to ensure sustainability like that's a very particular um a very particular kind of narrative and i am at the end and i think i actually might make my time <laughs> sacred story this is uh from the artist uh isaac murdoch and and i just wanted to leave you with this this uh this this message in that in this painting uh, by Norrell Morso, um, it's just for this recognition that we're all connected. Doesn't matter who you are, we're all connected. And we're all part of this grand story of the earth unfolding. And we always have a choice about who we're going to be, um, who are going to be in that story. So I'm gonna leave you with that and um, enjoying the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And um, you actually, finished before your time was over. So um, that gives us more time to hear from you during uh, Q&A. So uh, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Ruth Nyambura. Ruth Nyambura is a feminist political ecologist and activist from Kenya, working on the intersections of gender, economy, and ecological justice. Ruth is a founding member and the convener of the African Ecofeminists Collective and works with several regional agrarian and climate justice movements to track and challenge the privatization of the agrarian commons. She describes her work and activism that uses a feminist political ecology lens to critically engage with the continents and global food systems, challenging neoliberal models of agrarian transformation and amplifying the revolutionary work of smallholder farmers of Africa, the majority of whom are women, as well as rural agrarian movements offering concrete anti-capitalist alternatives to the ecological, economic, and democratic crisis facing the continent. So welcome, Ruth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura. I wasn't expecting to speak now. I thought it was later. <laughs> Uh, but it's fine. I'm, I'm a very prepared student, <laughs> so that's good. Um, thank you so much for the introduction. I'll just say one more thing about myself. I presently coordinate uh, the Hands of Mother Earth campaign, which is a global campaign of around 200 organizations resisting geoengineering technologies and other false solutions to the climate crisis. So um, I will begin. and. Uh, my talk today is going to focus on the possibilities of co-creating anti-capitalist, decolonial feminist movements uh, for climate justice. Now more than ever before, we are witnessing the convergence of multiple and intersecting global crises around food, around energy, around climate, around finance, the rising fundamentalisms and fascism, rapid militarization, and highly repressive states. And this year alone, the coronavirus has managed to perfectly lay bare the deep structural inequalities and marginalization that the world's majority experience as a result of our dominant economic system, capitalism. Women, children, girls, queer, trans, and gender non-conforming persons, people living with disabilities, peasant farmers, small fisher folk, informal street traders, indigenous peoples, factory workers, sex workers, pastoralists, nomads, the list is almost endless, all living in a world in which the exploitation of their bodies, their labor and territories continues to offer vicious incentives for capitalist economic growth. Quite simply, their lives are considered disposable and expendable by the economic system and the ruling elites across the world. But my presentation today is not about the state of the climate crisis. By now, the realities are clear, and more so for those of us on the front lines of this crisis, as mentioned above, and overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly residing in the geographical and political global south. We also know the systems, economic and political especially, that are responsible for the crisis. My presentation today is on the possibilities of a transnational feminist politics of solidarity for climate justice that takes seriously both anti-capitalism and decolonization beyond metaphors and pop culture symbolisms that they're so often reduced to these days, but a deep political praxis 
sorry, but thinking about them as a deep political crisis, uh, praxis rather, <laughs> through collective struggle and as sites for radical and rigorous intellectual engagement. Popular mainstream responses to the climate crisis within the United Nations, various multilateral uh, governance spaces, um, governments in the global north, corporations, the World Economic Forum, basically promote the commodification of nature in the, in the form of carbon market schemes, such as red plus, techno fixes such as GMOs, and a variety of geoengineering technologies as well as the heavy promotion of industrial animal and crop farming. These proposals have further entrenched already existing inequalities and created new ones. Communities have been evicted or rather continue to be evicted from their ancestral lands or lost due to the economies of scale that simply do not favor them when they take up this, um, these proposals or these schemes. They have been enrolled into carbon market schemes under horrible terms and often lie to about the real purpose and returns. These proposals also continue to pollute the earth as they, as they heavily rely on chemicals from the agribusiness uh, industries, which are firmly connected to the fossil fuel industries. We continue to witness the absolutely gross treatment of animals, disgustingly cruel treatment of workers in animal and crop, um, crop industries um, uh, in these farms, Many are poor, undocumented migrants, women, children from lower castes, black and brown. Basically, people who come from communities and countries on the, on the front lines of the climate crisis and who experience environmental racism. The proposals above or from this particular um, elitist institutions and individuals have nothing to offer in the form of justice and importantly, completely go against the radical solutions and world making of communities, of everyday people and transnational movements working on the intersections of climate justice. The violence we face is similar. From the Sengwer indigenous peoples in Cherengani Hills in Kenya, who from 2013 have been evicted, have faced waves of eviction from their ancestral lands because of a Red Plus readiness project funded by the World Bank and the United Nations Environmental uh, Program, to the undocumented mi migrant workers from Latin America working in meat factories in the US, constantly under fear, very personally aware of the violence of borders, and now dying from COVID, even as they're labeled essential workers, and whose own countries have been terrorized by the United States, to the peasants and land occupying movements of Latin America such as La Via Campesina and MST, to communities in Southeast Asia losing their land to palm oil plantations, to Indian farmers committing suicide because of their heavy debts, to the communities in Europe resisting the construction of new coal mines and airports, and to our friends in the Pacific, Pacific Islands fighting against militarization and extractivism. Our fights are not only similar, but we seem to be fighting the same powers. The contexts that unite us are real, but so are those that divide us. Community and solidarity in our movement work has often meant that many have had to stay silent for the sake of the greater good. That we stay silent on the issues of homophobia, transphobia, class, gender and sexualities, race, language, etc. Many of us are also leaving the impacts and the afterlives of colonization. Borders, which are fluid, but whose material impacts are real and are felt in the most cruel ways. So my call isn't a call for a romanticized solidarity, but a call for us to seriously engage with its possibilities, to think through what this new liberated world can look like if we work collectively, carefully and tenderly, and transforming local struggles to global ones and vice versa. It is a call to also think carefully about the possibilities of anti-capitalism and decolonization, Again, not as heap slogans and metaphors, but by centering questions of land, for example, which remains so important for many people still, especially indigenous people, many of us in the global south, by building power around the radical alternatives of peasant farmers, fisher folk, nomads, pastoralists, and urban farmers, 
contesting elitist and privatized ideas of who has a right to the city and what a city is, and by working towards a politics of the commons in these spaces. These are just a few example, examples. It is also a call to work across movements. We must. Benedict Anderson introduced us to the term imagined communities, the potential of making political alliance against oppressive power structures across divisive and often fluid boundaries, and a deep commitment to co-creating horizontal comradeship. Feminist scholar Chandra Mohanty takes these political concepts further by encouraging us to think about, about the possibilities of communities of resistance, different groups of people connected together, not by essentialist notions of their struggles, nor cultural or biological basis for alliance, but rather connected by the political, political links that they choose to make about their lives and their struggles. We have to think about power and we must rethink our relationships with one another to believe strongly, to act clearly and to build structures that reject the idea that we are disposable, that the earth and nature, which we are part of, are merely things to be exploited and desecrated. Ultimately, for me, decolonial and, and anti-capitalist feminist movements for climate justice have also have to be broad-based alliances also, not just feminist movements working on ecological justice. We have to make alliances with you know, the labor movement, for example, those working on sexual reproductive health rights, right? Because ultimately we are fighting against power and we have to transform the world as is. Solidarity for me, boils down to one word. What does solidarity look like to me? One of my favorite quotes about solidarity is by the Sandinistas. And they say that solidarity is an expression of the people's tenderness. I finish off with the words of Ella Baker and Bernice Regan Johnson. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And I apologize if I shuffled the order of panelists. I realized I was going according to a um, list that, was, uh, that I received earlier. Uh, so according to this list, I think I have um, Professor Sherilyn McGregor next. Am I right? OK, I'll um, go with that. So um, yes, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sherilyn McGregor, uh, who is a professor in the Department of Politics and the Sustainable Consumption Institute at the University of Manchester. Her research focuses on interconnections between feminist and green politics and between unsustainability and social injustice. Dr. McGregor's two most recent projects explore connections between climate change and care work and how environmental knowledge and everyday practices change or don't change when people migrate to UK cities from the Global South context. Her publications include Beyond Mothering Earth, Ecological Citizenship and the Politics of Care and Environmental Movements around the world, um, environment and politics, and the Rutledge Handbook of Gender and Environment. Well, thanks very much and good afternoon everyone from the tiny hamlet of Nibthwaite in rural Northeast England, uh, Northwest England. Um, I'm gonna talk about my work on a policy paper um, that sets out what a feminist Green New Deal would look like. I'm not going to cover the content of the, the paper because in my 10 minutes, what I really want to do is share some reflections that I think will be interesting food for thought for our conversations in this symposium. Now, I'm also going to try and share my screen. Hopefully that has worked. There we are. Right, um, so our paper uh, was commissioned by two UK feminist organizations, the Women's Environmental Network and the Women's Budget Group, to inform a national commission on a gender equal economy. We were asked to make this, make this a document that speaks to a policy audience 
and that can inform feminist side events at the forthcoming COP26, which is going to be hosted by the UK and has been postponed to 2021. My author, Maeve Cohen, and I did a critical review of existing Green New Deal proposals in the UK, which we found in political party manifestos, in NGO reports, and in a bill that's before Parliament right now. But this was back in February, um, and since then, due to the pandemic, um, all Green New Deal talk in the UK, as, as it is in many other countries, has now been merged into discussions and campaigns for a just recovery or building back better. So the, co the collision of climate emergency, the COVID health crisis, and a looming economic depression has made alternative progressive policy visions like the Green New Deal more relevant and urgent than ever. And it has made a feminist critique of these visions more urgent and relevant than ever. So what were our crit criticisms of the Green New Deal that we saw on offer? Well, first of all, we saw it as a very elite driven process crafted by policy experts and think tanks who are really not very representative of the population. And they have a very narrow focus on greening the economy and creating the kinds of jobs, mainly in tech, um, energy and construction se sectors that are very much about, um, you know, uh, hard men in hard hats lifting solar panels as depicted in this um, uh, campaign uh, brochure from the Build Back Better uh, organization. They have very much sort of masculinist assumptions about what the economy is for and what a green agenda looks like that really f fail to challenge gendered structures and stereotypes. There's very little acknowledgement of social difference and the pictures, um, the pictures that they use really do speak volumes and, and we criticize them in, a, in, a, in this tweet, as you can see. And actually, since we um, criticized these gendered images on Twitter and in a blog for Open Democracy, the Build Back Better campaign has changed them to these, slot, these images um, just to show the bit of an impact here. And I don't know for a fact that we caused this change, but I think somebody must have been listening. So let me give you my reflections. Um, the first reflection I have is that this was very much about putting care work at the center of analysis and recommendations. And this centering of care work achieves three things. First, a focus on care work means that all those who do the bulk of it, so women and racialized people, are placed at the foundation of economies and recognized for doing the work that keeps economies going in good times and bad. So contrary to a vulnerable victim narrative, we can say that those who do paid and unpaid care work are the ones who make survival, learning and change possible in the face of climate and other existential threats. Second, the costs and benefits of care work are measurable. Data collected by and analyzed by women, women's budget group economists lend persuasive evidence to back up the arguments that investing in care makes good economic and political sense. For example, their modeling has found that each pound invested in care produces, each pound invested in care produces three times as many jobs as an equivalent investment in construction. Each job created by investment in care is, not, is only one third as polluting in terms of greenhouse gas emissions as each job created in the construction industry. And women's budget group of opinion polling has also found that the vast majority of people and of all genders want care work to be properly paid and for men and women to be given equal time to do unpaid caring. Third, centering care work highlights that a fundamental contradiction of capitalism is, is that it exhausts and kills the very foundations on which it is built. The pandemic throws this point into bold relief. It demonstrates the logic of domination that results in the devaluation and exploitation of the more than human world and all those humans who are treated as less than human. For example, in a, there's a public health study in England that recently found that men of color are up to 150% more likely to be employed in care work than white men and three times more likely to die from the virus. They too must be included and can be included in our care work analyses. 
What also must be included in these calculations is the free subsidy that care work represents to people in positions of power. Here, I think we can do more to expose the epistemic ignorance of elites, mostly white, younger, and able-bodied men, whose privilege gives them, in Joan Tronto's words, a pass out of frontline caring in households and in care sectors. This is the ignorance that leads them to draft Green New Deal and build back better plans that are very far from transformational in a feminist sense. They are in fact quite happy to carry on with what I call caring as usual. My second reflection is that our feminist Green New Deal project represents collaboration and learning between feminist activists and, and, and academics. This, is, this brought together two advocacy groups that hadn't had much to do with each other before now. And until now, there really hasn't been very much attention to environment and climate on the part of most feminist groups in the UK. What is more, the framework that our paper uh, presents is really, it's not new. It is a consolidation of tools from the feminist toolbox that Carol talked about earlier. It's a consolidation of scholarly insights that have been around for a very long time. So in our paper, we brought together the tools of intersectionality from black feminist theory, Nancy Fraser's principles of gender justice that include material, political, and symbolic dimensions, Diane Elson's 3R argument that, that unpaid care and domestic work has to be recognized, redistributed, and reduced in order to achieve, to achieve substantive uh, gender equality for women. And because feminist theory has tended to focus more on gender questions than environmental questions, we brought in insights from eco-feminist political economy and feminist ecological economics. Going back to the pioneering work of Marilyn Waring, this approach theorizes the interconnections between capitalism's treatment of caring labor and the more than human world as infinite resources for human use. It also says that this exploitation must be resisted and repaired simultaneously, never sacrificing one for the other. My third and final reflection is that this has been about changing the narratives. And I say narratives plural because I think there's a need and a potential for feminist visions to challenge the mainstream narratives as well as a need to change the narratives within broader feminist communities. To some extent, our paper has already started to change the dominant narratives in the UK. Um, slogans such as care jobs are green jobs and build back equal have been taken up by politicians such as the shadow chancellor of the exchequer and the leader of the Women's Equality Party. A feminist Green New Deal that calls for a care-led recovery and a care-led climate justice strategy is a powerful way to change the dominant cl climate narrative. But what else needs to happen to realize its full potential? Well, I think in addition to pursuing, to, to be, being able to pursue and, uh, and, and to persuade policymakers, it will take, a, take diverse forms of activism inside and outside systems, within and without institutions of knowledge production, inside and outside political movements at all levels. A key task for improving the prospects of a new narrative, I think, is to push back against the tendency to think that centering care only involves taking the emotion or looking at emotion and not work. So putting ethics before political economy. I'm actually quite fed up of seeing um, the green guys taking credit for discovering how important and inspiring care is while not bothering to engage with eco-feminist theory or continuing to reduce its contribution to care ethics, or worse, continuing to use outdated tropes such as the ones that say that eco-feminism is essentialist or all about women being closer to nature. To conclude, as the title of my talk signals, I'd like to name our Green New Deal vision as an eco-feminist one. For me, eco-feminism is simply an amalgam of environmentalism and feminism. It puts together two powerful counter-hegemonic uh, movements and, it, and together, putting them together, make them doubly capacious and an extra strength, serious business. 
but we need to talk about changing the narratives, the tropes and the caricatures that for too long have blocked ecofeminism's power and promise, to quote the late philosopher Karen, War Karen Warren. And changing the narrative is already underway. You'll find that the new generation of young climate activists is very happy to name and claim ecofeminism, and they associate it with words like intersectionality, solidarity, care work, and justice. But regardless of what we call it, it's clear to me that this work that we and many other feminists are doing poses a fundamental challenge to the dominant paradigms now being used to confront the interlocking crises of climate, capitalism, and COVID. And this challenge rests on, an rash, on rational arguments and demands for the politicization and democratization of care. Thank you. Thank you, Sherilyn. Um, I'm going to uh, move to Professor Joni Seeger. Um, Joni Seeger is a feminist geographer and environmentalist. She is the Goldman Distinguished Professor of Arts and Sciences at Bentley University. Before that, she was Dean of the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University in Toronto, Canada. In the environmental field, she is a early pioneer in bringing feminist perspectives to bear on global environmental policy, activism, and analysis. Among her recent work, she is the senior gender specialist on a multilateral project to develop a gender assessment of the waste sector in Mongolia as part of an examination of policy options and sector reform in the broader context of climate change mitigation in waste sectors in emerging economies. Uh, she has been a consultant to the World Wildlife Fund and for the UN Environment, Global Environment Outlook, GEO6, and a coordinating lead author for the data and knowledge sections of the assessment. So welcome, Joni. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. And Thank you to Carol Cohn for convening this amazing um, symposium and Melissa Kay for making it happen. Um, I am going to talk today about some kind of hunches I have and not a fully formed research project as such, but a, a, um, a train of thought I'm trying to follow. So, as we all read through, and I'm sure we do, read through policy and technical literature or move, move discussions on the transition away from fossil fuels, two main impediments to the move away from fossil fuels are always identified. Economics, um, are we ready to economic move away from fossil fuels? Or technological, um, are renewables ready? Um, are they scalable? I actually think the discourse around scalability of renewables is itself problematic, but I'll put that aside for the moment and just say that economic race is the impediments or kind of the trigger points for identifying when we can move away from fossil fuels. Well, in late 2020, some of the good news, there is some good news, is that both of those impediments are crumbling. Um, renewable have surpassed fossil fuels in the EU for electricity generation in 2020. Uh, BP, British Petroleum, uh, just put out a report a couple of weeks ago that said fossil fuel demand has peaked. It's over. Um, the World Bank says it's no longer financing upstream and extractive oil and gas activities, although it's a little fudging around the edges, but they have declared that the European Investment Bank has stopped lending for fossil fuel projects. The Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund has said they're not going to put money into fossil fuel investments and so forth and so forth. I'm keeping kind of a running list. The big players and the big money is leaving the fossil fuel playing field. And when that happens, you know that a new day is around the corner. This is a moment where I always like to quote Arundhati Roy um, when she said, Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. I don't think we can quite hear the breathing yet of the release of fossil fuels, but we're not quite there yet. But I would posit that the end fossil fuels is within sight. 
um, and um, kind of normative policy and rational economic behaviors would move us away from fossil fuels at this moment. However, and here's w w where my feminist curiosity gets engaged. Just at this very moment, there is a dissonant counterflow, particularly among um, particular government leaders and policy leaders, of doubling down on fossil fuels um, and a, kind of a stubborn attachment that defies the sensibility of the economic and technical objectives. The irrational attachment to fossil fuels, particularly in the US and Australia, where the government leaders and the mechanisms of government have been deployed to ratchet up commitment to fossil fuel. Those aren't the only places in the world, but they are important exemplars and important players. So to me, I say, what's going on? What's this about? How do you explain this? And so in my current thinking, I posit that what we are witnessing is the emergence and the hardening, the doubling down of what might be called the identity politics of fossil fuels, particularly missing what I've come to call petrobromance, an emotional and ideological attachment of certain male elites to fossil fuels when it makes no sense to be that attached to fossil fuels. But that's the nature of romance, right? Sense and sensibility compete. So romance supersedes sense, and that's why I call it a bromance. Um, a foundational fact of this elite bromance, a foundational related fact, is that the fossil fuel industry itself, the actual extraction of oil, gas, and coal, is a highly masculinized industry. It's almost an entirely male workforce from top to bottom. Um, it's also important to note that at the top, the capital benefits of fossil fuels accrue mostly to men. The industrial and investment structures of fossil fuel represents an elite capture of wealth that is a male capture of wealth. Now, while it's fun to um, dwell on kind of the macho industrial practices of fossil fuel, and we could go off on many riffs about drill, baby, drill, um, um, and, uh, and like metaphors. Um, I, I don't really want to focus on that kind of macho industrialization, but I think that it's intertwined with this elite and policy-making attachment of male leaders to fossil fuels long past the time that they should really give it up. Um, you have, um, both in rhetoric and policy, you have uh, Donald Trump saying things about dominating the Permian Basin. I don't think he'd know what Permian meant um, if his life depended on it. You have um, Scott Morrison in um, Australia bringing a piece of coal into Parliament to say, we will never give up our attachment to this. Apparently, the actual piece of coal he held up in Parliament had been shellacked, so his fingers didn't get dirty, which is a little side note that I really love. Um, but the attachment to fossil fuel is bigger than saying that the benefits of the, industri of the industry accrue to the male workforce and the male elite. We're seeing a mutual constitution of a particular masculinity in association with a fossil fuel um, formation. And so my curiosity goes there. The distinctive masculinity formation that attaches to this most macho of energy forms. Of course, this is the point where I need to say there are lots of variants on masculinities, including eco-positive masculinities, but in an era of climate crisis, the petrobromance is urgently problematic because it is operationalized as national and even international policy. So if I circle back to the beginning where I said the conventional wisdom about obstacles to transitioning away from fossil fuels is economics and technologies. Those are, of course, key instrumentalities. But so is, I would argue, masculinity. In serious, this particular masculine formation, in serious spaces of policy, including activist spaces, and I love Sherilyn's uh, comment about uh, being fed up with um, the green guys, I share that fed upness. So in, in these serious spaces, 
where climate futures and energy choices are intensively scrutinized, and policies are formulated, we need to also take seriously masculinity as a driver of environmental policy and environmental destruction. Now, I've been in many of those spaces. I know uh, that people on this panel and attendees to this panel have too. And it is very difficult to put masculinity on the table in these serious policy conversation rooms. But I would argue that if we don't do it, we are going to hobble our capacity to make meaningful change. And at that point, I think I'll stop a couple of minutes ahead of my time uh, so that we have time for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Joni. Wow, I think we are doing really well on time here. Um, so our final uh, speaker for this morning is Reverend Mariama White Hammond, um, who is an advocate for ecological and social justice, youth engagement, and spirit-filled organizing. Reverend Mariama is the founder pastor of New Roots AME Church in Dorchester. New Roots is a multiracial, multi-class community that is innovating new ways of being a church. Reverend Mariama is active in secular and interfaith justice efforts. In particular, she uses an intersectional lens in her ecological work, challenging folks to see the connections between immigration and climate change, or the relationship between energy, policy, and economic justice. She is a fellow with the Green Justice Coalition, which brings together eight social and environmental justice groups from around Massachusetts. She speaks throughout the country and was the MC for both the 2017 Boston Women's March and Boston People's Climate Mobilization. As the former director of Project Hip Hop, she used the arts as a tool to raise awareness for social justice. Reverend Mariama. Morning. So I began um, by acknowledging that uh, the Massachusetts people on whose land I reside, um, when I go running um, to the beach close to my house, I often look out in the harbor and see Long Island, which is where many Massachusetts people were sent so that colonizers could take this land. And so I honor their legacy. They had a relationship with this land which was deeply interdependent and it is this way of being that I hope to lean into. My name is Mariama Mayeva White Hammond, I'm the daughter of Gloria and the granddaughter of Sadie May and Wilhelmina Eva. And a descendant to many women in my bloodline who never knew freedom but who prayed for me and loved me before I existed. I give thanks to the ancestors, Harriet Tubman and Octavia Butler, Ella Baker, and so many whose names I do not know because historians never bothered to document their narratives, but their legacy makes my being and my work possible. So ever since I can remember, I dreamed that the world would change. I don't know exactly how, maybe it is that the ancestors planted it in my bones, but I just never felt like this is the best we could do. I remember particularly as a four-year-old, I was blessed to meet Mrs. Rosa Parks when she came to my preschool. Many people do not know, but she was an avid um, advocate for early childhood education and spent um, her latter years um, doing a lot to encourage um, the need for young people to receive education um, in their early years. I remember that in preparation for her visit, we practiced a small play which recreated her famed act of resistance and refusing to give up her seat on December 2nd, 1955. As I got older, I started to question why we did that play when Mrs. Parks clearly knew what happened better than we ever could have told it. I'm sure we got some of the facts wrong, um, but I would like to think that her heart was touched by the experience of seeing preschoolers, and particularly a little black girl like me, acknowledging her courage and recognizing her as an elder. 
Mrs. Parks embodied the idea that a better world was possible. And while most people only know her as a catalyst for the bus boycott, they know much less about her work to document the unprosecuted rapes of Black women across the South by white men. Very few know of her work to support young people, like 15-year-old Claudette Colvin, who refused to give up her seat eight months before Mrs. Parks, and who Ms. Parks encouraged to get involved in a lawsuit um, that predated her sit sitting on the bus. Even fewer know about the work of Joanne Robinson, who worked with other women to call for the boycott um, while the mostly male clergy folks were arguing, including Dr. King, and debating the next steps, such that they almost squandered the moment and the women had to get on top of it and say, we're just gonna go with or without their permission. I know these women and this story because it is out of that tradition that I come. And as I have grown and spent time learning, reading, and listening to part members of that movement, I've come to know the true history of the civil rights movement much better than the pat stories you hear about Mrs. Parks just sitting down because her feet were tired or the imagination that Martin Luther King single-handedly by himself created all the justice that we see in the world. I'm grateful to be in this space in which we are talking from a feminist perspective. And I have to be honest that I rarely explicitly frame my work from a feminist womanist perspective and this tradition of radical Black women is the tradition in which I am rooted. I would not be without it. I consider myself part of many movements for justice, including environmental justice, racial justice, immigration justice. However, if you ask me to find the work I feel called to, I would characterize my work as ecological justice. I choose that frame because ecology is the study of systems and relationships between beings who coexist in space. While I am not invested in the critique of the term environment, my experience is that environment is something most humans see as external to themselves. Saving the environment is about us intervening in some way that sets right something that is wrong with the planet. From my perspective, ecology situates us in the picture and asks us to see ourselves in relationship with all the beings around us. The truth is that we are in, we are in an interdependent relationship with the rest of the world. And our greatest sin and stupidity is our denial of that basic fact. As a woman, I am all too familiar with the patriarchal ethos which imagines that one single virile man has produced a feat like building a tower or orchestrating some major business venture while denying the contribution and labor of so many people who made that work possible. Ecological justice is about naming our interdependence and calling attention to the deeply destructive relationships that are a cancer in our world. Ecological justice says that our work is to get into right relationship. The move towards a balance that would radically shift how we live with other humans in the world and bring us into a deeper level of connection and respect for all the non-human beings on whom we depend. But many of those beings we often overlook, the way that a CEO overlooks the work of the janitor or a father takes for granted all of the care work that allows the family to thrive. If you center yourself in ecological justice, then technocratic solutions cannot fix the climate crisis because technology is not the problem. The next new gadget or invention cannot address the dis-ease and disorder in our relationships. If you center yourself in ecological justice, that immigration and racial justice are just natural pieces of the conversation. If you center yourself in ecological justice, 
you have to grapple with the deep imbalance that has characterized gender relations possibly since the dawn of time. So that is the frame in which I center myself. And then I wanted to take a moment to pivot towards this moment that we are in. And I, um, like a previous panelist, Joni, want to take a moment to um, speak a, a quote that came from Arundhati Roy that felt so real to me in this moment. She says, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and, re and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our databanks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly, lightly with a little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. The truth is, as an activist, I guess I've always claimed that I was fighting for another world. I mean, in my vision of where we were going, it was so radically different from how things are. And yet, 2020 has definitely taken me for a loop like everyone else. It was interesting because the beginning of this year, our church launched a book club reading Parable of the Sower, a book by the writer Octavia Butler, the mother of Afrofuturism. And in that book, I won't tell you the whole story because if you haven't read it, you absolutely have to. But in that book, a young woman lives in a world that is crumbling around her. And so we started to ask this question, what do we do when the world we are in is one that must die? How do we walk in to a new world and a new way of being? So we're asking this question, we're studying it, we're thinking about it, we're doing a sermon series on how to pack a go bag and thinking about learning to walk by the stars. And in the middle of all that, this pandemic hits. And then, as we go into the pandemic, we face it, we deal with it. I'm in Boston. We were one of the epicenters of the pandemic in the US. Um, and then the racial justice uprising flows out of that. And this idea of George Floyd being unable to breathe the barbarity of someone being able to keep their knee in someone's neck until the lifeblood literally flows out of them. And I like to imagine that George Floyd called out his mother who was deceased because he unfortunately was beginning the transition from this world to the next. Maybe he began to be able to see her Maybe she reached out to her hand to him and welcomed him, not because he should have been dying, but because he needed to be embraced by a community of folks who knew the depth of injustice of this world in which we live. My call to us today is even as we deal with all of the challenges of this moment, as many of us are trying to figure out how to balance <laughs> between um, living this Zoom work life um, with family and children um, needing more from us, as many of us have become homeschoolers, um, a role we never quite uh, imagined for ourselves. We are leaning in to a deeper love and respect for teachers maybe than we've ever had before want to suggest that this moment could be one that we don't just try to get over and move past, but that in this moment, there is a break, a small tear, and maybe quite frankly, a growing tear 
and the fabric of the system that we have. I believe that that tear could be a wound or it could be the opening of childbirth. My challenge to us is to imagine how the contractions of 2020 become a moment of birthing, a pain that takes us to a different place, a portal into other possibilities. I think that this is more than possible. And I look forward to being in dialogue and conversation um, with other members of this panel and with the rest of this community as we imagine how we lean into this moment to emerge on the other side, a different people living in different relationship with the planet. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Mariama. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists for these very rich, deep, and insightful um, commentaries. Um, I'm still um, thinking about what particularly Reverend Mariama um, concluded her comments with, which um, even though as we know, and as Carol framed the conversation this morning, that um, we are talking about knowledge systems and conversations uh, that have been unfolding, particularly within the feminist community for decades. Um, I think we are also speaking at a moment of crisis. And what you just laid out to us, um, Reverend Mariama, um, is both uh, deeply disturbing living in this moment of crisis, but also it opens up a window, um, a way to imagine um, uh, and bring in creativity in the different kinds of approaches we are talking about this morning. So thank you to you and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, on that note, we have some time right now to have all of you in conversation. And if you have um, any questions that you would like to ask of each other, we can certainly proceed with that. I just want to say a few words, um, given the many threads and synergies that I picked up on um, in the various conversations. And again, um, talking about it in terms of knowledge systems and oppositional knowledge systems, and also thinking about systems um, that are put in place in an oppressive way. For instance, um, Ruth and several others talked about capitalist and colonialist um, systems of power, um, but also thinking about um, ways of resistance and reshaping that have been ongoing for centuries. And that particularly um, came out in the comments that uh, Deborah, you made, um, that resistance has always been a part of um, this deeply violent um, and um, colonialist um, framework and histories that indigenous um, populations and particularly women have lived with, responded to, and negotiated with. Um, and I'm also, you know, on that note, um, thinking about the current situation and how uh, of the pandemic and how that has also brought to the fore um, very visibly these stunning inequalities. Um, again, uh, turning to you, Ruth, you talked about the sort of the paradox of um, essential workers uh, versus the dispensable bodies um, of our society. And I think, you know, this is, I'm thinking of all of the images um, that we have seen and read about, um, experienced, uh, particularly I'm thinking about uh, in South Asia, uh, migrant laborers walking miles and miles um, when 
the lockdown was announced um, in India within uh, with four hours notice. Um, and uh, the, the tremendous uh, inequality in the ways in which even, um, you know, differently positioned migrant laborers were uh, treated at that time. So at the one hand, we saw um, migrant laborers who bring in a lot of remittances, for instance, from um, the Gulf Arab uh, states were being flown in um, to on private jets. On the other hand, um, laborers who um, live on daily wages had to do this trek of thousands of kilometers um, back to their home villages. Um, at the same time, we saw communities um, organizing around this path, um, offering food and water um, to these um, migrant labor populations who were simply left um, bereft um, at, at that time. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking basically of this sort of paradoxical ways that we elevate um, this category of, of people who we call essential workers um, at the same time, treat them as um, dispensable bodies and labor. And what is it that a feminist approach of care, particularly if we think about it in terms of a care economy, um, what, what, what is it that we could think about um, that would move us beyond a profit oriented um, approach um, to the economy, to one of interdependence and, um, and ev even, you know, I'm thinking about several of you uh, talked about love and what would a, a care economy uh, drawing on principles of lo love uh, look like? And you know, speaking of love and emotion, I was also really um, intrigued by what you said, um, Joni, um, in terms of this uh, fierce emotional attachment to a particular kind of masculinity um, with regard to uh, the scrutiny of fossil fuels um, at this time. And you, know, you termed it as an emotional attachment, um, right? And um, also, I think it was um, Sherilyn, you talked about emotion and ethics um, in changing the narrative. And of course, um, emotion um, has often been feminized um, in um, discourses of economy and uh, politics. And, um, how, how can we draw on powerful um, emotions like anger, um, outrage, um, and, you know, calling on um, what Audre Lorde uh, said about um, anger with precision um, can be a very productive um, use of power. So, you know, I was also wondering if I could ask um, you to comment on these differential uses of emotion, right? Emotion as a source of feminist um, knowledge and resource and power. And on the other hand, this very sort of entrenched um, emotional attachment to masculine power and how that impacts um, our global uh, power relations and even solutions at this time. Um, Yes, I, um, you know, and, and another thread that I also wanted to just mention is um, this, you know, several of you talked about balance um, and uh, balancing in terms of, and I think um, Ruth, you talked about um, what would a transnational um, solidarity at this time really look like. So, um, you know, and it's uh, Chandra Mohanty, um, I believe, who had um, said that just as it is so important to transcend um, borders, um, at the same time, um, the borders that we speak of are um, very real, powerful, and entrenched. So if we can also think about um, more um, and together um, this sort of um, balancing of transcending borders, but at the same time, being mindful, of course, that um, 
how inequalities um, are also mapped onto these borders as we um, try to think about what meaningful feminist solidarity looks like. So I think um, I will turn to um, all of you and invite you to um, talk to each other or respond to um, any of the themes that I mentioned, or you know, if you'd just like to share um, your comments at this time. And you can um, raise your hand and I can go to you or just, um, I can also call on, Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I can um, start by asking um, Deborah um, and um, Mariama. Um, you both talked about um, genealogies of love and um, drawing to that um, principle within the communities that you work with and that it has um, always been a base of knowledge creation and social justice um, and the and you bring that into your work so um, i was also struck by what you said deborah that you know we also have to consider the knowledge that land holds and that we, even as we try to create um, these collaborative knowledges, that uh, we also have to draw knowledges out that, that are out there and, um, you know, are very much part of this ecological system. Uh, so maybe we can start with the two of you, perhaps, if you saw any synergies um, in the commentaries that you provided. I'll start because I rather, uh, like, it's really hard to uh, go after Mariana. Uh, she's so, she's such an awesome um, communicator. I, I think, um, so good questions. Thank you for the, uh, for the summary. Thank you to all the other panelists, like just so much food for thought. I just have like notes everywhere, but I won't make anyone endure what my desk looks like right now, taking, trying to take notes. I think, um, and, and, and also relating a little bit uh, to what uh, Mariana also was talking about. This is a really interesting time, like she described it as a portal. But I think for many Indigenous peoples, and I'll speak more specifically, I guess, to the context in, in Canada, is that we've kind of been in that portal for a long time. <laughs> Some scholars would say, you know, we're already in this dystopia, like we've already been in this dystopia that the rest of the planet's been living on for some time right, where um, you're, you just see this massive destruction all around you. And you can, and, and you have to have um, underlying principles and, and knowledge that's very embodied. So like part of, you know, the, um, the emotion that you talked about and, and summarize people's comments, that you have to be, you have to be driven by more than um, again, very targeted anger, which is to me like very productive and you, you need to have that, but you also need to have these other grounding principles that enable you to be able to see those possibilities, to imagine, um, imagine a different future, even, even in the face of destruction. So in my mind, even as I'm talking or as I was listening to the other panelists who are like amazing scholars and I'm inspired by, by all of them, is I keep thinking of, of stories that we have in Anishinaabek. Like even in our creation, there's, and uh, I always tell people, but remember that's an English word because automatically people think like Bible type creation, but that's not, <laughs> it's more like a process and a verb uh, in an Anishinaabek context, but there's also a destruction. And that, so we, in our stories, we speak to that, we weren't perfect. And in the destruction, it's because people aren't behaving properly. Um, people aren't, um, they forgot with how they're supposed to behave and conduct themselves in relation to the earth as being a living being and a source of life um, and creation. Um, becoming arrogant, all those things, all those diagnoses that everybody talked about, the masculine, all that, that's what people start to do. So there has to, so there almost has to be a destruction to, um, to enable regeneration and, and renewal. Um, and then there's a, there's a recreation. 
and it's a cycle so it's not like a linear thing so the other thing is you have to get out of that linear thinking uh, which uh, I think uh, you know indigenous feminisms feminism and other feminisms can contribute to that very linear type of thinking how do we go from industrialization capitalism to COVID-19 to this it, like that linear kind of thinking is also problematic but that's another story so for us um, often in our stories we're we are um, uh, saved, it's not the best word to use right now, by other beings. So um, in the recreation in Anishinaabek, that's the muskrat. In the pipe and the eagle story, that's another destruction. It's the eagle. And the eagle does it for love. They both do it for compassion and love. So, so even in the face of absolute disaster or destruction, those are the underlying principles that are going to get us out of the mess. Um, and as other entities who don't forget their responsibilities, who don't forget what it is that they need to do to support life, and they then become our teachers, like we're, we're to learn from that. So in these stories, we learn about, okay, even in the face of disaster or destruction, destruction or dystopia, um, love still matters, compassion still matters, caring about future generations, eagle saves us. Um, even if we're, most people are behaving very badly for future generations to enable them to be able to learn these obligations um, and principles to be able to support all life. Um, so that's a, a lot of the foundation of a lot of the, the work that I do in relation to Indigenous knowledge and the stories that I hear all the time. Like this is, this is why it comes up. This is like normal conversation to have in an Anishinaabek world, right? Like we also have the conversations of capitalism, colonialism, a patriarchy and those impacts and all the, the multiple crises that I talked about before. But we, but you always, um, like another principle is always to have hope. Like what's our hope? Again, this idea of this, this portal. So we're always constantly in this portal of having to envision a future in light of everything that we're facing. And we can't just rely on people to solve it. Someone said, technology is not gonna solve it either. It's just, like in my mind, it's not, um, probably we're, we're not gonna be able to figure it out. <laughs> that we need other beings. We need what knowledge they have to share with us if we're able to, to listen and have that capacity to help us move, uh, move through this time to, um, to a future that supports um, all life. Um, I'll stop there because I'm super keen to hear what <laughs> Marianne has to say. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers the question, but it's, um, yeah, there's a lot more to say there, but I'll, I'll stop. So thank you for that. Yeah, so I, I start by uh, thanking you. I, I think you are completely right. There are folks who have always knew, known we needed to shift, never thought this way of being was right. I think um, we are in a moment, however, where the earth is demanding it of, of us. Um, I, in many ways, I think of it as a um, mother earth has been in an, an abusive relationship with us for many years and has said, you know what, if it's if it's gotta be one or the other of us, I might choose me, right? And I think that, um, you know, when people say we're trying to save the planet, no, she will exist. Now we may do a lot of destruction on our way out, but she will exist. Um, the question is whether or not she's willing to let us keep living up in her house the way that we behave. And we behave very poorly. Um, and I think we are very close um, to, um, an eviction notice because everybody else that's living there is not thriving because of us. Um, and so I think that um, for me, what this moment is, is the magnitude of the, co of the consequences are breaking through into more of the human consciousness. And I thank you for acknowledging many people have been holding this consciousness for a long time. Just most people have not been willing to listen. And I think, um, quite frankly, COVID is um, bringing us all to a greater sense of vulnerability and fragility. Um, I won't make any political commentary to a person who, even after getting COVID, doesn't seem to get it. But that's a whole nother thing. Um, but I think, um, you know, one of the things a lot of what we do with our, our kids, for instance, in the church is this question of like, what we often say, what is God telling us through the animals? What is God telling us through the plants? Um, and so I, you know, I am very active in activist work um, and, and, and am the co-chair for the Green New Deal table in my state, et cetera. But I, I think that for, from my perspective, um, the power of rooting in ancestors and history 
but also in the children that are coming behind us is just to be, um, I think it situates us humbly um, that it isn't really all about us. And it reminds us um, that we didn't get here by ourselves and that we live with the responsibility to folks who come after us, which all species get. Like trees, there's so much energy in producing um, uh, a, a bunch of different seeds, many of which will not make it, but they put so much into the sugars and the um, leaves and all of that to create um, the possibility of future life, right? And, and we imagine all sorts of other things that we are able to do, but we have lost track of that basic function that, that we cannot do anything to the world that makes it impossible for future generations to survive. Um, and we're the only species with that kind of profound confusion about one of the basic meanings of, of life. And so um, it is my hope that to some extent, there is much suffering happening, so I don't want to minimize that. But that um, the fact that we've been put on a bit of a global timeout, that we've been sent to the corner to like have some time to think about it, um, is making us awaken to some things that our constant activity has um, allowed us to ignore. And for me, um, it is. For me personally, my powerful image is of people who continue to exist in slavery with the only hope in many ways being that their descendants would be free. And the profound responsibility that places on me, um, not living in that same, in anywhere near that same level of bondage, to ask what is my contribution um, to that legacy um, and, and how it flows. So I, I, for, you know, again, for me, I think it is just how I grew up. Like we always talked about ancestors. So it's, I'm not, I'm not going to claim that I like decided that this is the ethos to which, you know, I would <laughs> aspire, but I do think it profoundly roots me. And I would say, um, is a reckoning. I would also, um, think should be considered by those who descend, descend from more colonist traditions. Do you know your people? And how do you understand your, their legacy in your life, your responsibility to that legacy, both in honoring it and in some instances, shifting it in a, di in a different direction? How do you um, situate in there? And I, I think for me, it, it has been a powerful way of existing in the world that for me changes my orientation um, to this moment um, and, and elongates my understanding of what is happening and puts it beyond me. Thank you. Um, I think I'll turn to Joni and um, Sherilyn specifically if you wanted to uh, speak with each other a little bit about ethics and emotion. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, this is Joni. I'll, I'll jump in for a minute. I, I, I've been, um, as Deborah said, I have notes now all over my desk uh, from uh, today's um, conversations, which um, is just a fantastic. This has been a fantastic symposium. Um, and again, my thanks to uh, the organizers and also to uh, everyone who's participating. So some of my notes, I'm writing down kind of keywords and a lot of the language that um, uh, my fellow panelists have used are about love and care and stories and tenderness and life basis and tears in fabrics and earth agency and relationships and justice. And I feel as though um, this is all so powerful, but it's also, you kind of implied this, Alora, in your comments, feels that we're just living in this parallel universe where we say this to each other and we all nod and go, yes, and we know what we mean. And yes, this is the kind of um, uh, fragility that we need to respect and recognize and bring forward and vulnerability. And then there's the kind of the whole other universe that has no access to this um, no access to, no respect for, no interest in, complete disregard of um, this kind of an, these kinds of analyses and these kinds of relationships that we're um, uh, bringing to the front here. And so one of my um, 
continuing frustrations, and I'm sure with everyone, uh, is how we bridge these universes of kind of the structures of power, and Ruth um, uh, particularly um, drew attention to kind of rapacious capitalism, how we bring these frameworks that we have, that we've laid out here today, to bear on and to be in conversation with and to help to dislodge the kind of mainline conversations around um, resources and use and profit. I, I just, it's kind of mind boggling to me. I don't have anything more intelligent than that to say. It's just like, hold on, we are living in parallel universes and I don't know how to dislodge the dominant universe that is causing all of these disruptions that are so um, deadly in every sense. So I, I just kind of put that out there is how do we, how do we create a bridge? How do we dislodge uh, the dominant discourse? And I don't know that that helps anyone <laughs> in the next conversation. Sherilyn, what do you think? <laughs> you well, can actually I, work in, in policy circles. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, I hope that what my comments was certainly not meant to say that we should no longer be making, you know, using emotion and embodiment and ethics and all of these um, arguments that are so powerful and, and, and so important. But we certainly have been finding in, in the UK conversations is that I think, you know, feminists have to work really hard to counteract the assumption or the kind of stereotype that when we talk about care, we, we really are talking about things that are soft and gooey and, and not hard and, 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 you know, really serious policy um, discourse. So, so trying to make the argument that it's also about work, it's also about political economy, it's also about what, how economies run, that's what we've been trying to, to, to kind of translate into, into, you know, popular discussion and policy discussion. And, that, and that's what I've been finding is that we sort of have to, you know, br do that bridge from the kind of mainstream t to the feminist arguments, but do it through a, um, one that really, uh, you know, foregrounds the economic argument um, and, and, and sort of disabuse people of the assumptions that kind of come with either ecofeminism or, or feminist arguments. Um, Ruth, I'd like to um, invite you into the conversation and um, firstly, if you have any responses to uh, what the panelists have been sharing in this segment of the conversation, but also to, you know, ask you to say more about um, solidarity and how you were uh, beginning to talk about a solidarity that doesn't rely on a sort of a romanticized call for solidarity, but you know, really rooted um, in the various kinds of systemic inequalities um, that we are talking about. Thank you so much. And it's been wonderful to listen to all of you. Um, you know, uh, it's really interesting that you mentioned uh, Chandra Mahanti when you were giving a summary of um, um, what we had presented on because Chandra's work has been very instrumental for me in thinking about uh, the possibilities as well as the pitfalls and the limitations of um, transnational feminist solidarity. But I want to start also someone else, someone's work who has been very instrumental for me in terms of thinking about working across difference. This is Audrey Lord, and I want to read something very quickly from uh, There's No Hierarchy of Oppressions. And um, Audrey says that I cannot afford the luxury of fighting one form of oppression only. I cannot afford to believe that freedom from intolerance is a right of only one particular group. And I cannot afford to choose between the fronts upon which I must battle these forces of discrimination wherever they appear to destroy me. And when they appear to destroy me, it will not be long before they appear to destroy you. And I love to think about that because uh, one of the things I was saying in my own presentation is that um, our oppressions might not be the same, but they're similar, at least in terms of the powers working to collectively destroy us, right? Uh, to make us disposable. The powers are the same. Feminists have long argued against um, essentialist ideas of 
our struggles and essentialist ideas of who we are, for sure, right? And again, I go back to saying that I don't believe that, um, you know, um, a kumbaya solidarity. I don't subscribe to that. I don't subscribe to movement spaces where um, people are being homophobic, they're being sexist, um, class questions are not being addressed, race questions are not being addressed. I don't subscribe to that. But at the same time, because of my work with, in fact, I tell people that I am a feminist precisely because of African women farmers. Before I ever read a feminist book, or almost a decade ago, the lives of African women farmers fundamentally changed the way I saw the world. It is also because of their work and their struggles that I became anti-capitalist before I had really adequately gotten into, you know, uh, reading anything around anti-capitalism. And this is simply because, um, you know, in terms of solidarity work, in terms of thinking about the possibilities, right? It's not just about simplistic centering of narratives. Narratives are important, they are, you know, but unless we locate our narratives of oppression or joy, but in this case, uh, oppression, unless we locate them within greater superstructures and power, like the economic systems, political systems, uh, whatever they may be, we risk, um, as Audrey is trying to say that, this idea that, you know, um, freedom is mine. It can only be mine. I have to see how today it's me, tomorrow it's you. I have to see how we are connected in terms of like the struggles that we have, even though they are not the same, right? So for me, that has been very important in terms of thinking about what the possibilities of collective struggle are. And uh, one of the things I really loved, in fact, um, Elora, you actually made me very emotional when I was listening to you, when I was remembering um, the migrant workers um, walking in, in, um, in India, because I remember that and the outrage uh, from various spaces. And you're right, um, even just like how governments have responded to, I mean, the class, the very class responses, caste responses to the particular crisis that we find ourselves in. But then you rightly say that even in the midst of what the state was doing, all these people lining up to give food and shelter to the migrants. And I think about the trains in Latin America, you know, when migrants are going to the US, the women uh, making food and giving to the migrant workers, right? I think about, you know, informal traders in, in Kenya protecting each other from uh, the brutality of the, of the police. You know, and I also think that we spend a lot of time thinking about the impossibilities of solidarity than thinking about the possibilities of solidarity. Because for sure, the most marginalized in the world continue, the most marginalized who face the worst, you know, still find ways of being in solidarity with one another. And solidarity is a very difficult thing. And you rightly said that, um, you know, divisions, for example, um, around borders, they have, you know, the material uh, implications and the material impacts of borders, for example, um, are very clear. These are not things you just imagine, right? Um, and even debates, even within feminist spaces around um, sexuality, right, um, are often very difficult conversations to have. So this is not to say that the challenges posed in front of us, right? Or the ways in which the world has been crafted, whether it's through colonialism, right? Or whatever models are there that have created the world that we have, that the impacts are not real and they're not felt. But we have a lot of templates every single day, poor and working class people, indigenous people, farmers, nomads, fisher folk, and this is not to romanticize them also, right? That they're living in this utopia of, you know, kindness and tenderness and amazing things. But we, are, we do have templates of building concrete solidarity based in our histories and based on material realities. That is very important. So that we're not building solidarities out of air. They have to be grounded in our histories. And our histories, many of our histories are really painful. Many of our histories have been erased. Many of us are still working to recover histories. That is true. Um, but at the same time, we work with that to build this new and emerging world. When, as you said, like I also love uh, the quote by um, 
Arundhati Roy, right? Um, you know, and also the Zapatistas talk about, you know, uh, many worlds in one world, right? For those of us who dream about freedom and liberation, we must spend more time thinking about the possibilities and building the structures for this new and liberated world. I refuse to give in to a pessimism of um, the possibilities of creating this new world. Otherwise, we'd have to give up and say that, well, uh, the world is what it is. But throughout history, throughout time, whether it's the anti-colonial struggles, whether it is the feminist struggles from across the world, ordinary people have come together and shown us that it is possible to defeat power but we also have to think about power because the other side is great at thinking about power and they're great at destroying us when they have power so we have to think about power and we have to think about the possibilities of collective action to collectively liberate ourselves so i wanted to respond to that because i that i i just really thank you that resonated so much with me um ruth and and i think um, Joni, you are raising something that is very real, <laughs> and I want um, to caution us against either or thinking, like we're either going to live in this space or we're going to live in that space. Um, I, I, I live in a lot of spaces. Um, <laughs> I, you know, am an advisor to like a solar investment company, but I'm also working on like, you know, a black farming project that's trying to reimagine like what economy could be and how we would distribute food beyond the money system. So I think the way I see it is, um, I, I talk about four R's. One is around reckoning, and that's really about looking at, facing, dealing with our history, um, interrogating those narrati narratives, um, and then the work of resistance, of pushing back. But then there's two other pieces, and I think we're decent about those first two pieces, but the reimagination and recreation is so key. And I think that in our movement spaces, far too often we haven't invested in the generative work. Like I'm not against resistance, we definitely need to do it. I've you know, got arrested fighting pipelines, I get all of that. But we can't ask people to leave a world when we have no um, imagination for how this new world might be. And we have to create spaces where we are practicing being something else. So I think, um, you know, I try to be multilingual. I can go up there, I have my fact sheet about the economic impacts and what it's gonna cost and where I think the tax money can come from, blah, blah, blah. But I um, try to still be grounded because I don't believe that is the source of my power. Like, and I'm really clear, I'm talking this to you because this is what you believe and you are, you know, people are invested in a certain power system. But like, I, I want us to be careful about negating our own power. Like there have been times, where I remember one time I had this like fact sheet and instead I just sang, I like was in the middle of a hearing at the state house and I just started um, singing a song that was written by a, 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 a great sister who wrote the song during a meeting in which black pastors came together and were like, why have we all buried somebody in their thirties from cancer? This can't be right, you know? And they eventually found out it was a cancer cluster from uh, improper and, and illegal dumping of ash near their community. But I think that um, I've had legislators come up to me afterwards and be like, what do we need to do now? I, maybe I get a little bit more latitude because I'm a pastor. Um, that clergy thing may work for me, um, but I, I think that um, when we live fully in our power, those other systems um, may work to deny it, but they can't fully deny it. There is still something within each human being um, that desires to be deeply connected. There is that spark there, and I, I just want us to um, be multilingual, have the facts and all of that. But I, don't, I feel like we also have to awaken that other way of being or else we, can, we will not win by fact sheets. We will not shift because we, you know, we, just, we had a better written piece than the other. We shift when that awakening happens on a massive scale for all of us. So I just think figuring out how we exist in that world while always agitating for, um, the awakening of different ways of being that I believe really are in every human being, even 
those who have tried to ignore them, including myself at times, um, to move forward, to you know, establish myself. Um, sometimes I too have um, tried to be something else. And um, I just decided like, you're not gonna, I know this system is falling apart and corrupt. I'm just not gonna keep validating it. <laughs> so I, th I think it's, it's finding that balance. Thank you. Um, I think we have um, questions from the audience and I'm going to turn to Claire Duncanson, who's going to be um, moderating this segment of our conversation. Um, I'll introduce Claire. Uh, Claire has published widely on issues relating to gender, peace and security with a particular focus on gender and peace building. She teaches and supervises in these areas to undergraduate and postgraduate students at the University of Edinburgh. Her current work aims to bring a feminist analysis to the political economy of building peace. She's the author of Gender and Peace Building um, and many articles on women, peace and security agenda. And she works with Carol Cohn on the feminist roadmap for a sustainable peace project. So, Claire, to you. Thank you, Laura. Okay, so I have been um, monitoring the questions that have come in from the audience and we've had a, a real range of wonderful questions. I'm not going to get to them all, but luckily some of them have been picked up in the, in the rich conversation that the panellists have had over the last 20 minutes. So I'm hoping that some of you who asked questions will feel that you've, you've had, had them responded to. Um, I will, I'll kick us off with three questions that came in um, and, and if, if you can try and be fairly succinct in your answers, I'll hopefully have a chance to, to feed you some more. So one came in for Deborah, but, but maybe all the panellists might have something to say on it. And that was a question from uh, Sandiso Mizi Weeks, who was asking mm -hmm. around the is there a, a tension or an issue with using a human rights lens or a human rights approach to the advocacy for indigenous people and the earth's rights? So she's thinking there, she elaborates of the feminist and third world critiques of human rights as being conceived of in ways that are very much in keeping with the patriarchal forms and assumptions, you know, individualism, propriety, domination oriented, that, um, that are in keeping with imperialism, patriarchy, and so on. So it's that kind of, to what extent is human rights approaches a good way forward? And then a question that came in um, for everyone, and that is related also on the issue of rights. So um, a question talking about, the, given the extent of climate change's drastic effects, um, is it time or is it, would it be useful to be thinking about um, granting nature rights? Would that be a way forward to address climate change? So, so what do the panelists think about um, rights to nature? And then a third question that came in to everyone um, was uh, from Alice Hubbard. Interested to know where the panelists see the role of young people in climate justice in particular young people of colour. So how can they be engaged and participate with meaning when they're so often marginalised from decision making, not seen as actors with agency? So I don't know, Deborah, if you want to kick off first, given that that first question came into you, and then panellists can give me a wave to um, let me know who, who wants to answer next. Thank you for that. I, I, did, I did manage to read that in the panel and I thought, what an awesome question. Because um, it, is, it is something that uh, in the work that I do in relation to Indigenous climate justice and sovereignty it comes up all the time. Um, and for me, I guess personally and professionally, it's always, um, I'm, a, I'm always kind of wrestling with that. So, so human rights is, it, you, you're right, it has to be 
there, there's problems around it because it does see, so I'm thinking in terms of the human right to water, for example, when that was finally recognized, human beings need water in order to live, which is true, we all do. Um, and, uh, but the, what, the way that it's framed in the United Nations systems is humans have a right to water. Water is a resource, water is a commodity, water is property. So, so it automatically creates this binary between people and this entity from an Ashabi point of view that we need to live, that everybody needs to live. It also doesn't protect water itself. So, uh, so it's only like human beings right to, again, this to as opposed to like with. Um, so for example, and this is where I wouldn't actually deny human rights either, because there's like horrible things going on around the world. And this is sort of always, uh, you know, always gets sort of brought to my attention again, where like, okay, we can't ignore that either. It's just not enough. Like it's a thing. Like it's part of like the map of one of the things we have to pay attention to, but it's not the answer either. Like people who basically, you know, have to get their water on the side of a ditch by the side of the road. Um, obviously, you know, there's, you know, a human rights violations going there. And then the solution by the state is, well, let's just give people like bottles of water. Like that's somehow the solution without addressing the actually underlying core issues there, right? So there's, so I agree, there, there, it's, it's, um, it's important, but it's limited. And it doesn't, it doesn't anywhere capture, like, you know, how people actually understand um, and relate to water. So it, it's not going to capture everything that's important in relation to Indigenous rights, the way you would see it uh, laid out in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. But even that has its limitation, because that's generally telling the state what to do. So as opposed to what we might need to do um, as Indigenous peoples. So where, um, the way I'm starting to try to frame it now is, is recognizing the limitations of, uh, of, of the rights framework, but it's still important because awful things are, are going on and it brings these things to, to our attention, is with it, um, is to frame them um, with Indigenous legal orders as being the foundation for the work that I do. This may not be relevant to what other people do, but that would be, that's the foundation, which would then think about these relations very different. So we think about what's our relation with water, what's our coexistence in relation to water, not as a commodity resource, um, private property like it is um, in, in many states. So you're applying a different, I guess, ontology to it. You're applying a different um, epistemology to it, these things that Carol talked about. So, um, so no, you're absolutely right. Human rights is has its severe limitations, but at the same time, I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's I I don't know why we say that. That's a really awful kind of metaphor. Like who's going to do that? But uh, or hopefully nobody does that. Um, but uh, but also knowing some people's lived realities, it's still important. But it's got its limitations, even in relation to indigenous rights. So so in my work, I'm looking at okay, what are other kind of foundations for how to think about this? That that's you know, not going to get stuck in those kind of binaries and really kind of move us to a different way of, of um, relating to, um, I guess, in a, in a responsible way in terms of duties and obligations to these other entities. So, so hopefully somehow that, that answered that. I did, I did think about that and I thought that question was like bang on, like to really bring out what some of the limitations are. So thank you for that. I'll stop there so because I'd like to hear from other panelists as well. Ruth, you were wanting to chip in? Uh, should I go? Yes, okay, so I'm just gonna take two questions. One that was already um, in the Q&A that Professor uh, Farhana Sultana put in and uh, around basically, um, you know, the connections you make beyond, uh, beyond identity. And of course, identity does serve its own purpose, especially for those of us who um, our liberation, uh, anti-colonial struggles were uh, identity-based, even though we had also transnational solidarity when you think about it, international anti-colonial struggles. In 2015, just before the Paris Climate Agreement, um, a number of us uh, working in the international climate justice space went for um, political solidarity meeting in Plogoff. This is in Brittany in France, where in the 1970s, um, community, this community had rejected a nuclear power plant. And it had been a really big fight. And we're sort of returning 40 years or 41 years after they had won the fight against setting up a nuclear power plant. And I remember thinking how beautiful Plogoff was. And someone in our group asked, um, asked them, um, 
France gets its uranium from Niger. Niger is one of the poorest, most, no, it's not poor, it's impoverished. One of the most impoverished countries in the world, has one of the highest cancer rates in the world. This uranium is used to power um, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, have there been any connections between you and uh, Nigerians? And a representative from the community said that over the years and with different engagements, they had realized that if we are going to say no to nuclear in France, then we must also say no to urana uranium mining anywhere in the world. If not here, if it can't happen here, then it's not going to happen anywhere in the world. And this community has been offering solidarity in various ways to the Nigerian, um, to the people in Niger, basically. And that is an example of seeing ourselves beyond ourselves, seeing ourselves as part of a larger thing. And knowing that we have to not, it's not just about stopping the plant here. We have to stop extractivism wherever it is. And for me, that is really simply the best way for me to answer that question, where you understand your context, your situation, but you meaningfully decide to engage as a collective because you understand the power structures at play. The second question, um, and I'd be happy to have a conversation with you uh, after this. Um, the second question is to the response, or the question around how can young people, especially from the global south, um, get into this? And I really feel like this is a, you know, those things when people say that, a letter to my 20 year old self. And I feel like that's what I'm doing now. Um, and it's a question I've answered uh, before this year. I became, I'm 31 years old now, and I uh, got into movement building work, uh, radical spaces when I was 19. And I was very lucky to have fallen into the hands of activists who not only meant well for me, but were very clear that they were coming together to organize, to organize for freedom, not for fame, not for publicity. And that has guided me and informed my work. First thing is that not every table or space is meaningful. Please, you don't have to go to any space. Many of these spaces we are invited to actually need to be dismantled. They need to be set on fire. I do not mean, uh, uh, please don't set physical fire. I mean, I don't mean it literally. But these are spaces to be destroyed. They are not meaningful spaces. They are not democratic spaces. One of the things I said in my presentation is that decolonization is not a metaphor. You can't decolonize everything. Or the way to decolonize some things is to literally destroy them, right? And build new spaces. That's the first thing. The second thing is to uh, be careful about the law of the limelight. You have to be very critical about the media, about social media, um, and this sort of voyeuristic thing that people expect that, and this was my experience when I was much younger, that often um, media houses or even civil society groups in the global north would invite me to spaces and expect me to give them poverty porn stories. And I don't have poverty sto uh, porn stories. I will never have poverty porn stories. But I have stories and narratives about oppression within power structures. I have something to say about capitalism. I have something to say about colonialism and its afterlife. I have something to say about structural adjustment programs. I have something to say about the corporations in the global north that exploit us in the global south. That is what I have to say. And often they wouldn't want to hear that. Right, because especially in Africa, you know, they want you to say, you know, um, this really basically very horrible stories. Again, just poverty porn is the way that I can describe it. So you have to be very careful about spaces and people who expect you to dehumanize yourself. You know, people who don't expect you to speak about power, who don't expect you to dignify yourself and your communities. So it's important to think about that, right? So not every media invite is something that you should accept also. Not every panel, not every meeting is a space that you necessarily need to, need to go to. And finally, this should have been the first, but it's okay that it's the last. You need to be focused on your work. Define your politics. What do you stand for? I am an apologetically anti-capitalist. 
feminist. That is how I move in the world. And it's not an identity, it's a praxis. I struggle with every day because there's no, des there's no perfect destination for anti-capitalism or feminism. We struggle with it every day, but it is something, it is a journey that I have chosen in, 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 in collective spaces with other people. Define your politics, be focused in your work, be rooted in your community organizing, because that is how we get free, by organizing. Be strategic in your political alliances and um, run away from any space that dehumanizes you, makes you feel small, makes you feel unseen. But I promise you that there are very many wonderful people within the ecological justice movement that I have personally encountered, that you will encounter comrades, friends who are fighting for a new world or new worlds. So you will be, you will be fine. So that was my, that, that was, yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so the, um, there are so many rich questions and there's not going to be time to get to them all. Luckily, this is only the first panel of many. So um, people have raised, you know, the relationship between um, uh, human rights and rights of nature. They've raised the relationship between identity politics and transnational feminism, between indigenous feminisms and mainstream feminisms, between um, violence against women and violence against the earth. So these are all things that you might want to pick up on in your closing comments and over the next um, and next three days because I just thought the questions were wonderful and I'm so sorry we couldn't get to more. Um, but with that, I'll hand back to Elora to just um, ask the panel for their closing comments. Uh, thank you, Claire. And uh, thank you again to the panelists for those really insightful responses. And, and, and really, I'm thinking of um, these very concrete sort of map you've laid out, Ruth. I'm going to certainly um, use that in my classes for um, you know, thinking about organizing and organizing for freedom. It's wonderful. So uh, we are almost at the end of our panel. And um, I'll turn to you, um, each of you, if you can share with us uh, what you would like us to think of in terms of takeaway messages um, from this panel uh, and as we move on to the next two days. So I think, you know, we can go in the order we started with. So I'm going to ask um, Deborah McGregor first to offer closing comments. Thank you. Ruth, I love that answer too. I love that. I'm glad you answered. <laughs> you, you took that one on. Um, I think just in, in terms of just my, my, my final thoughts, um, and I always sort of um, tell people that I do this because um, because I also research. So generally what I like to do is just ask questions. I don't have to know all the answers to everything. So I just wanted to leave you with some, some questions that draws on the panel. Um, and some of the questions that were posed by people who were uh, joining us in the conversation today is just to um, think about the kind of stories that we want to tell, like how are we going to change that dominant narrative right now that's not actually solving the problem or, or often hitting on the um, hitting on what might be the the actual um, core core problem. So what are the kind of stories that we want to tell and how do we want to tell them? Um, I guess that the, in a lot of the work that I do is particularly when I enter into these policy spaces, what I find is that people just didn't ask themselves the right questions, like people, like including scholars and academics. I think a lot of the times people on the ground and grassroots people do, but then that's why I think we struggle with a lot of these, um, a lot of the answers to the big problems that we're facing, because we didn't like, you know, and it was usually dominated by men, um, and usually scientists in a lot of these spaces, and they didn't really care about the concerns of that of a lot of people raised uh, raised here today. But I think what I'll what I'll leave you with is is so we need to ask ourselves questions that are different and imaginative and look at opportunities. But I also think that the other dimension of of our humanity is that 
it is it is true that we can be very destructive and and i think about a lot of the stories in the Anishinaabek tradition where there's a lot of warnings about how not to be that but it's there um which we can see unfolding in the planet right now but we also uh, it is part of our humanity have this immense capacity to be um creative to be innovative to um to love to have compassion um, and be fierce about those kind of things too so i think that we also need to look at um, what is it that we have in terms of our intelligence and our will and what we can actually offer each other and the world in order to be able to flourish um, that we need to to build up and um, and support the, those aspects of ourselves as well individually um, and collectively so I think yeah I, I like to focus on that as well I don't have the answer to that but I think that's something that if we all think about it that might um, help move us along so thank you for this opportunity and look forward to hearing the others um, Ruth, I'm going to turn to you uh, next for some final comments. Um, I just really, uh, I'm very grateful to be, to have been in community with all of you today. It's, it's meant a lot. Um, it's always fantastic to be in community with fellow feminists. And thank you so much for um, everyone's questions. And really, um, I'm going to end as with the words that I concluded with when I was giving my presentation. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you, Ruth. Um, to you, Sherilyn. Well, yes, I thank everyone for this opportunity and I, I really enjoyed um, spending the last hour, two hours listening um, to everyone's comments. And I suppose what I hope is a takeaway is, I mean, I really like the concept that I, I mentioned when I was speaking earlier about ep epistemic or epistemological ignorance. And it was a, it's an idea that, or a concept that comes from Charles Mills originally. And I first heard it in that context, in, in his writings, but also at, when Joan Tronto writes about the epistemic ignorance, that means that so, some people don't get to understand the importance of care um, and the work of care. And I think that that concept is really important in really helping those of us who have privilege, uh, whether it's white privilege or being an academic, um, really have to um, be dedicated to just listening, shutting up and listening and learning. And um, I think um, I feel very, hum you know, very, I've learned a lot and I think that I um, feel very uneloquent as well. <laughs> I think that the limitations of being um, a full-time academic in a neoliberal institution like a university um, really, you know, have to be, <laughs> challenged um, and we have to learn from and listen to activists in this in this space. So thanks again, everyone. To you, Joni. Great, thanks. I'll be very brief. Um, just building on Ruth's comments about her early activism and my early activism in feminism, um, I came very quickly to learn that feminism is not a spectator sport. Neither certainly is feminist, decolonialist, anti-capitalist, environmentalist a spectator sport. And we need to be, I'll use Mariama's really useful um, term of multilingual. And um, uh, tweets may be necessary, but far from sufficient. I think we need to be able to act in communities, in the streets, um, in policy spheres, and we need to be flexible in the way that we interact with all of those different spaces. Um, and I think that the papers and the, uh, I mean, the presentations and the um, uh, points that uh, the panelists have made today um, are witness to that, the effectiveness of that multilinguality. Thank you. And to you, Reverend Mariama. So I um, first want to just um, also give honor that when folks were talking about young people, I will. I just want to say um, that there are moments in this work where one gets tired and one finds it hard to believe 
um, that you are moving towards the freedom you hope for. And I, I want to say that it's been um, the engagement of young people in my community, um, particularly young people of color. I know there's been a global movement of young people, but there are a particular group of young people of color that I'm in relationship with who have brought a new level of urgency to this work um, and have made it, um, have lifted me spiritually to be able to um, continue moving forward when um, there have been moments where I not feel, I felt like we are winning. <laughs> um, I want to offer gratitude um, to, to Ruth for sharing um, the, that, uh, that song and, uh, and those words. And I will close by just quickly singing something that was a, a favorite of my grandmother um, and that she taught me. And the song is, I don't feel no waste time. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy and I don't believe you brought me this far to leave me. No, I don't believe you brought me this far to leave me. Thank you um, again to our wonderful panelists today. Um, if anyone imagined that this was only going to be about uh, policy, certainly we have opened the conversation to poetry, to song, to music, to love. Um, and I really look forward to the next two days and continuing to ask uh, what Deborah said imaginative questions. Uh, so thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Carol and Melissa. And thank you to all of our audiences today for your participation. Um, I hope that you will all join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. for the next panel titled Feminist Critiques of Mainstream Solutions. So with that, goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone.